everybody. Welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind Show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Hello, everybody. Where we help average everyday people. Well, I keep saying average every day, but we help <laughs> everyday, everyday people. people create wealth through real estate investing. And that's what we do. So very special guest on today. And uh, I want to bring him on. He is a, uh, uh, he works for the Gibbs Gibbon, Gibbs Gidden, I said it wrong, <laughs> Gibbs Gidden Law Firm out of uh, Southern California, Mr. Jeffrey Love. Thanks for being here, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. You're not the first to bungle the name. I'm sure you won't be the last. <laughs> you know, I, I called you Jeffrey Love because one of my best friends is Jeffrey. So I, I'm sorry if it's Jeff, but I, I said Jeffrey. So Jeff. <laughs> so, Jeff Jeffrey, Jeffrey works too. I, I go by both. So you're an attorney and all of us in real estate are going, oh, no, an attorney. Here we go. We got to talk to an attorney, right? Which is good. I think it's good to have the information. But I want to know you as a human first because I think it was great when we first got on. You said, I said, have you done many of these? And you said, I love, tell, tell us what you said. I said, I've been doing more lately because it gives me an hour or so break from my little kids. I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old who have been coloring on the walls and yeah. running our walls. Um, like wonderful little kids, but little terrorists, forget the word, uh, <laughs> when they're on their, their, their playing. So this gives me a little break from them. Which is, <laughs> talk to you have a little grown up time. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, so as as we are recording this podcast, we are still in the in the midst of COVID and everything. Are you guys? You're in California. We're in New York. Are you kind of on lockdown a lot now? I mean, semi sort of there, or we we're going back and forth. We've got I think four different tiers where they're moving different counties to less restrictive tiers. In LA, we're still in the worst one. So our two week supposedly, you know, being at home in March has now been through November. I think I've been to my office maybe one time and it doesn't look like it's gonna lift in LA County at least anytime soon. So being that your last name is Love, you could have, you know, there's that, there's that um, book or movie, Love in the Time of Cholera. Your, your, your life can now, 2020 can now be about uh, Love in the Time of COVID, so. The hell is Love in the Time of Cholera? What it's is... a movie or a book or something. Never heard of that ever, oh but okay. Gosh, whatever. <laughs> Never heard of that. It get was them, like- Get the culture. For, Oh, okay. <laughs> you live with me, so I don't know. You are my culture, apparently. Anyway, so Jeff, tell us. So you are an attorney. So what got you? What 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 brought you to go to that down that road? Ironically, I don't know if you knew this, but I I was uh, going to, out of high school. I was going to be a lawyer. That was something I wanted to do out of high school. I thought uh, people said I was a good uh, litigator, so they thought I should go ahead and be a lawyer. Until I saw how much you had to read. <laughs> and then once I saw how that much you had to read, I was like. Yeah, so I'm out. Yeah, but, look at his bookcase. I know, yeah. I know. The, the book, and yeah, that, that's only a portion of them. I'm kind I of. I also see about I also see about 50 candy bars behind you too, but that's how you keep the sugar rush going. So. You know, that, we're right after Halloween, so as any parent can do, you have to make sure that everything's safe. And yeah. a lot of people, I guess, were expecting less kids, so they gave out big candy bars. And they're too big for a two-year-old and four-year-old, so dad and mom had to take them and. We keep them in here so <laughs> smart move a good a good trick is to um get them to trade their candy for a toy yeah, from one parent that. to another yeah. good, good luck with that so anyway tell us about you tell us how you got into the in the field of uh law i actually wanted to be a real estate developer i had a you know family friends and, and colleagues of my parents that were in real estate and it's just it always appealed to me thinking you know no matter what your business is what you're doing you you need real estate whether you're you're a restaurant or you're working in an office you're filming a movie on location it just I, I liked real estate um, so I went to you know under undergrad thinking I was going to do it and I said you know I'm going to law school and learn about the law to kind of do that for a couple of years and help me understand the contracts and legal documents I'm probably going to run across buying and selling or leasing property I went to to law school with you know really that intent and took the classes to get into real estate, learn about transactions. And I graduated right in the kind of the Great Recession. People weren't wanting you know, real estate attorneys. So I ended up working for two different companies. One was a recycling company and one was a real estate developer as their attorney. And I realized that- Jeff, you were an in-house attorney? I was the in-house attorney for both. In-house, okay, okay. Um, for the cycling one, actually their first one. So kind of learning a little bit on the, the go, completely opposite of most attorneys who work for firms and then go to a company. I was the yeah. reverse, just kind of a happenstance of the circumstances at that time, but realized that 
I actually like to advise it, the companies better than actually doing it myself. And even more so when I ended up jumping to my firm was I loved the client, but I wanted to work for more clients, different clients, different sizes, different projects, and not focused on, on, on one thing. The, right. the developer I worked with was 18 million square feet across the country and really on you know, industrial and retail real estate. And I said, I, I want to work with developers. I, I want to you know, do, do office. I want to do syndications. So that's how I ended up at my current firm. And I just really like being behind the scenes and getting to work with different clients and different problems. And it's every day is different. Yeah, you like it sounds like, you like the variety, right? The variety. It's it really is. You know, and a lot of attorneys they may focus on you know one aspect of it. What's the coolest thing about my practice is every day is different. And you know, today I'm helping a client you know, review a purchase agreement for a triple net retail property. And oh. yesterday I was helping a different client that's a developer, and their business model is kind of your fix and flip model, at least how they started. And you know now they're kind of doing more ground up construction. So all within the realm of real estate, but kind of completely different problems, different issues, different client sizes. And to me, that's what keeps it interesting. What do you think? Your what's, what's your favorite? <clears throat> Put you on the spot. Sorry. <laughs> Good question. Um, you know, I I really I'd say the kind of midlife client. What I mean by that is not the client that's been established for 20 years and not the startup. Because when, when you're starting up, everything, you're, you're, you're penny pinching, you may not be able to afford the legal advice, you may try to cut corners just to get off the ground. When you have that kind of midlife client or you know, this established client, you really start learning from your mistakes and say, hey, I did this wrong, I'm gonna do it this way. And you become more efficient you improve your cash flows, you protect yourself, and you, you limit your exposure. And seeing that light bulb click in clients and saying, this is what I've been telling you to do for the last five years. And hey, now you finally agree, you're taking the advice. <laughs> That's what I love to see. Yeah. And you know, it really just shows how far they've developed and how much they've learned as a client and how much more successful they are. And that, to me, that's the, the coolest thing to see. So how would someone at least partially skip that learning curve section? So we have a lot of we have a lot of new investors that um, are listeners here. So it would probably be good advice to be able to give them up front saying, hey, if you knew X, Y and Z, you know, you could get to that spot of being a, a midline investor a lot sooner than, you know, what, what what mistakes do you see people make in the beginning that they could skip if they and had the right advice? Remember that. I don't know how many people, how many states where we are in New York, we are a, we're an attorney state. So you have to have, you don't have to, but trying to do a closing without an attorney is just difficult. And I think you, you're in a title state, correct? I am. So, so there are, we have people from all different realms that, that are listening to this. So just think about that when you're with your answer, because there's different people that do different things for, you know, different ways to close. They are both excellent questions. Uh, Glenn, to yours first, we're, we're title. So we, unless it's a, sophisticated real estate transaction, expensive, or you're on the commercial side, you, you may not have an attorney involved whatsoever. Your brokers will prepare your, your contract, especially if you're buying you know, residential real estate. Um, you'll open escrow, you'll engage a title company for your title policy, and it'll all be done with escrow. No one needs to be in person. Documents are docu-signed or e-signed. Um, wow, that sounds wonderful. Escrow. So there's no meeting at a table, exchanging money. There's no attorneys needed. So it's it really is the 180 from an attorney state where both sides have attorneys and they actually conduct the closing, at least in the past, you know, shifting of documents. Um, That's how we still do it here. Yeah, still antiquated in my opinion. But yes, but go ahead. Go, go back to the question. There's pros and cons to it because you know you're really out here relying on your real estate broker, and as with any profession, you've got really really good ones. And you've got ones that are not yeah. so good uh -huh. and the barrier to entry is not always you know the highest so as a buyer you may be buying expensive property maybe it's a million dollar property i mean heck we're in southern california it's just like new york there's parts that are not cheap right. and you're relying on this broker you're signing a contract where your deposit might be at risk um, you're relying on them for that transaction and really you know escrow and title who you, you've never met to make sure that you're protected against these risks that you might not know about. So it's really kind of the, the 
solution there is you kind of do your due diligence, make sure your agent, your escrow, your title to the extent you can, at least in a title state, are you know capable and experienced with what they're doing. Same with the lawyer state. You want to make sure your lawyer's experienced and you're not getting a personal injury attorney to conduct your right. real estate. Yeah, we've told people we've we've had um we've done transactions where we do our best to just just have them use our attorney just to make life easy as best easy as we can. And and once they've done business with us, they they do. But after that, it it can be challenging. But um, you know, you get more attorneys. Everybody wants to make sure they're earning their paycheck. So they're all kind of you know nitpicking the agreements like, oh and my god, can we just close? And if they're not specifically a real estate lawyer, right. that gums up the works even more. Well, I remember years ago having somebody that was a New York State like civil lawyer for something, you know, some department in New York State, and. All they want to do is fight, right? Oh my God, they, they're, they're picking apart every line in the contract. We're like, it's a standard real estate contract that comes, it's already been vetted by the MLS. And what are you talking about? You know, so, and, and again, real estate, what I found here is that real estate's very local in a lot of ways. Like, there's a lot of local, local little laws and nuances that make it work. And that's the way it is here, anyways. The same, same thing with you guys? It is the same thing. Uh, you know, and it's about relationships too. You know, with your, if you're buying and selling with, with the brokers, you know, and, it really is hyper local and that's how you know you know when you get some more investing away from you know maybe the flipping context but buying and holding or value add is knowing more than the next person knowing what this the fair market value of this house is or what it's going to rent for or i can change these items or i can become more efficient and that really is local and knowing your market knowing who your tenants are going to be how close you, what what businesses are there and i would know you know about that hyper local market in you know somewhere in Kentucky versus Southern California it's you know it's different right right so Glenn and I are really big like at our home flipping workshop we tell people you know what we're going to tell you the good the bad and the ugly about real estate and we like to even let people know about our failures because we think they can learn from them and it can help them from from reaching those things we don't have so. enough time to cover all them <laughs> in the next year <laughs> but, let's go back to that to that other question about how what advice could you give a new investor about things to avoid or, you know, failures you've seen? And the, the point to it, though, is to set them up for success and to shorten their learning curve. Not to scare the hell out of them, but, <laughs> but, we, can, but we can be honest. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's, a, it's a really good question. And as you said, there's probably more things that we have time to cover. But you're, right. you're, one of your big ones is I'll give you just a, a recent example is I had a client that was, is a developer tore down a couple old uh, duplexes and was building uh, new townhomes. He signed an agreement with his contractor and just let the contractor kind of run with the project. Contractor went a million dollars over budget. How, how much? A million, a million dollars over budget. How many, so give me some perspective. How many, how many things was he building? How many, what was the total project? It, it, it was about four townhomes. The, the total price of construction was probably about uh, about three million. So figure about twenty five percent over thirty three percent over but yeah. Okay, um, we'll continue what the on. What I learned from this is is oversight. You can't with any vendor, anyone you're working with, you can't just sign on the dotted line and and walk away. You're the developer. You're responsible for the project. You need to stay on them and make sure they're sticking to the budget sticking to the time frame um, because you're responsible and turn to your investors so the lesson from that he learned is you know is, is really oversight and making sure that i'm on top of everything and i'm managing my project what we, an expensive lesson it okay. is we we teach our students to um you know not only have a really detailed scope of work but also to make the payments that go out to that contractor measurable so you know pay the contractor in phases so it's not just like you're giving them a lump sum and that keeps you from going over budget yeah. because you have you have measurable benchmarks you know when is the when is the framing done and the rough end electrical and plumbing and paint and flooring and kitchen cabinets and all that you know there's there's those benchmarks and you get x amount of dollars when this is done so that keeps that from yeah happening. to go a million dollars over that must have been pretty it's uh huge. you must have kind of signed the signed that line kind of turned your eye because that's a, that's a lot of money that you think you would notice going out you know you think you would it's a good point you know it's whether you, there's different types of construction contracts, whether it's cost plus and you're paying them for the materials and their their overhead and profit, or it's a guaranteed maximum sum, this is the number. There's pros and cons to each type of contract, but you are paying them in installments. And get out California, at least 
when you're paying them, you're getting lien releases from your subcontractors right. to make sure that your, your individual or company supplying the lumber is not going to put a lien on your house. So every time I write a check, I'm getting lien releases from the work up to that time. I might be keeping a retainage of 10 or 15% for the end of each payment towards the end of the contract. So I have that and make sure those, um, those, those little items at the end get done, you know, that they're putting on switch plates and door handles and shower heads, make sure the, the small things actually get right. done. Yeah. Um, and that's just, well, that's just construction. That's just one item. You know, one of the other, maybe hit a kind of top three list is making sure that you're protected from a liability standpoint. You know, when, when you're starting out, it makes so sense. I don't need an entity. I'm just going to do it in my own name. Uh -huh. Nothing wrong with that. It saves a lot of money. But what happens now? You're building, and you're still getting, you know, you're still getting mail, and at that address, let's call it you know, a single family. I'm going to fix it and flip it, and uh, FedEx or Amazon delivers something to your house. You know, you ordered a shower head. They slip and fall. Uh -huh. Now yeah. they have a lawsuit against you personally. And if it's there's not enough equity in the home, your other assets are at risk. So yeah. while you may not need an entity, you want to supplement that risk with insurance and maybe have an umbrella policy, make sure that you're adequately insured, have a good insurance broker to mitigate that risk. Because it's a shame if your project's successful, you, you, you documented everything, you underwrited it perfectly, and you were going to make a hefty profit. And something really completely outside of your control comes in and takes that risk. Or you have an apartment building, and what do what you if your tent has a party? Someone slips and falls. You just Tell you people, don't know. Yeah, right. You you want to be protected all the time from all angles, and like you said, you buy in your personal name. A lot of people when they start, I know our first three houses, I think, were in our personal name before we before we woke up one day and said, what wait a minute. Risk? It, oh yeah, we, 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 said, we you know, and then we started looking at the. There's also there's tax benefits of having your own entity, of course. But then, you know, when you start looking at the protection side of it, that's the part that yeah. knock on wood, we've never had anything major, but we've had a few things here and there. But over the years, over 700 flips, we've had you know a few minimal, mi yeah. minimal. But like you said, Jeff, it can it, it can so, happen, and it takes time, it takes energy, it takes money. Yeah, just tell, save yourself the trouble. Tell people your experience with kind of where to set up the LLC because you know we we encourage a lot of Nevada stuff. We work with a, a good supplier vendor for a few, but but there's a lot of options to other places too. So talk about your your experience with that. Yeah, uh, a lot of the times I've talked about the you know the five W's of organizing or incorporating your business: who, what, when, where, why. They're asking about about the where. There's certain states that give you, you know, benefits over other states. Nevada, for example, gives you a, a much greater ability to remain anonymous than, say, you know, California. Delaware, for example, has probably the most you know, documented and understood corporate laws and business favored state out of any other state in the country. So you get a lot of big companies incorporating in Delaware. Um, what I tell clients to look for is weighing the pros and cons of where you're going to incorporate or organize. California, for example, someone might want to you know, organize in Nevada. That's great. But the problem is then you have to take that Nevada LLC and you have to qualify it to do business in California in order to hold the real estate. So now I lose my ability to remain anonymous and I'm paying taxes in Nevada and California. So the benefits of forming in Nevada, since you just went out the window and it might make more sense just to form it in California, pay our expensive, but $800 franchise tax, which is graduated. Um, but because the benefits of the other states go away. But if you told me I was buying a property in Nevada, I would do you know, right away in Nevada. Or if the property was in Utah or another state that didn't have the same requirements as California, Nevada's a good state. Wyoming as well. You know, yeah. Nevada, Wyoming, and Delaware are probably three of the you know, preferred states to form entities because of their corporate laws. But you have right. to weigh the cost of it as well. In California, New York, expensive states, some of that excess cost negates the benefit that you would get to form an LLC or a corporation in one of these other states. What are your thoughts on, on protection with an LLC versus just insurance? We have some good friends of ours that have like 
20 properties in their name, all rentals. I'm like, guys, you really should get those. It's a, and they're all paid for. I'm like, guys, golly, you know, someone's going to sniff you out someday and just, you know, get get you for everything. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, we're fully insured. There's, you know, insurance versus, just curious of your thoughts with insurance versus, you know, being an entity protection. I'm just curious what your 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 legal thoughts are on that. I like both. And that's what, if you really want to be protected, let's do both. You put it in an LLC and you still have insurance because it's another barrier to get. The goal is to keep your personal assets, your home, your bank accounts, uh, cars, everything separate. So if one project falls, they all don't fall. Um, and one of the benefits to the LLC is you, your friend could put each property in a different LLC. So if there's a claim against one property, they have a claim against that one property. The other 19 are still safe. Right. To the extent there was a lawsuit against them personally, all of those 20 properties and all of their personal assets are at risk and insurance might cover it, but you know, you never know. There may be a loophole in their insurance policy, uh, but all look at all these businesses in the pandemic that have to shut down and they thought they had business interruption insurance and yeah. lo and behold, there's exceptions in those policies for that. Yeah. You just don't know. Who was the exception? It seems like an insurance, right? Hey, can I get this? Oh no, you're not covered for that. Of course I'm not. <laughs> it feels you, like that sometimes. You don't want to negate insurance. I mean, you hold an LLC, you still want your insurance and umbrella because sure. you want to protect your property. So now if there is a lawsuit or you have an investor, some whoever's making the claim, they have to sue you. They have to get through the insurance. Then they have to actually get through the entity to reach you personally. So it's really putting up another wall between you and those potential litigants. Yeah. The more you could put between the two of you, you know, within reason, I mean, you don't want to spend, you don't want 10 LLCs because then you're spending money and taxes and accountants going through everything. But within reason, you know, you're trying to separate yourself from potential liability and limit your risk. So it, it sounds like you've had your fair share of um, real estate clients and real estate, different types of deals and whatnot. What are some characteristics? So so our, our show is called the Real Estate of Mind Show. So we're all about mindset and um we, we yeah we believe that if you don't have your mind right you can't make a lot of money like if you're, right. you're just gonna you know if you don't have it right you'll find a way to lose that money you'll find a way to get in trouble you'll find a way to not hire the right lawyer right you'll find a way to do something to, to kind of screw yourself up so. so i'm curious of of some characteristics that you've seen in some of your more successful clients yeah good question that's a good question um probably one of the most important characteristics is the ability to look at things from call it like 10,000 foot view, bird's level eye, you know, not just with real estate, but really forming businesses. And what is my, what is my plan for this? Is, is my business strategy to fix and flip this property? If I'm bringing on investors, is this a value add? Am I going to hold this real estate for three years, five years? If I've got a partner, are we strategically aligned? Do they want to pump more money into this business or are they looking to make a, you know, make a buck and take it out and go do something else. So a lot of the problems we run into is because people didn't really think through. I, I, you know, I, I watch HTTV, I see these flipping shows and I'm going to go and I'm going to buy real estate and it's easy, but I didn't think through the process. You know, I didn't realize that the loan is costing me money or I'm getting private money. And every day, if I don't have my contractor lined up, that's money out of my pocket. Right. So really lining up the process, thinking it through, having that schedule, dealing with partners and running through my eventual exit strategy, that helps you think about things you've missed and making sure that you're efficient and that ultimately makes you more successful. We call that making business decisions versus emotional decisions. <laughs> yeah. That's what do you think? Bad. What do you think along that same line of the, the real estate of mind? What I think, you know, you were you probably you have repeat customers, right? They've done multiple deals, I'm assuming. Of course, those people that you've worked with, I think that the the public perceives that people that do multiple deals have just got everything figured out and they don't have any failures. And I think that you can, I mean, I'll or they ask don't have to you, get creative, or they right, don't have to figure it, yeah, right. That, that, that every deal seems to go like clockwork. And I just like you maybe to talk about that from from your vantage point. The people that are successful, are they always successful? Is everything they touch that are the Midas man, everything turns to gold, or yeah. do they have to? fight like a dog to get there. I mean, to get there. 
Oh, it is the latter. People, you, know, you don't always hear about the failures, you hear about the successes. Mm -hmm. That yeah. first line I mentioned with the contractor, that was a big screw up. And it ended up, you know, he made his investors whole, but now you know, five years later, he didn't make that mistake again. Right. So it's learning from those mistakes and that's how you become successful. But, you know, a lot of these clients, they don't have everything put together. You know, they're making mistakes, but the biggest thing is don't make that same mistake twice. You know, that's kind of a lesson for life. You, yeah. you, you learn from it. Yeah. And I was talking about those kind of midlife companies, why, why they're fun to work with is they're starting to learn from those mistakes and they become more successful on, you know, they're making more money, they're becoming more efficient, but they're getting there because they learn from the mistakes. You know, someone coming to you and say, I hit it out of the park on my first one. I've never made a mistake. You know, <laughs> great for them if that's true, but most likely they're just, you know, they're embarrassed to say, it. you know, they screwed it somewhere along the way. Right. And yeah. there's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no fault in that. You know, I've done thousands of transactions and the ones that are successful are the ones that, you know, okay, I fell. I, I, I'm going to learn to get back up and do it again and I'll do it differently next time. I'll learn from my mistake. That's what makes you successful because yeah. you've yeah. run through those mistakes, you, you've developed a system that works, and then you stick with that. You know, yeah. And that's what makes you efficient and successful. Yeah. That's the whole reason we started our own living workshop is to, to give people a track to run on and share our mistakes so that they don't have to make the same ones so that they can learn learn that way. And We spend time at, you know, the first on Friday morning of our, it's a three day workshop we do at our home for the workshop and we do uh, the first day we spend the the first the first morning about three hours on mindset and I say what I'm trying to get you prepared for is you're gonna get the crap kicked out of you on a regular basis and even though you know I, I laughed Jeff when you said someone comes to me and says I I had a successful deal out of the gates I'm gonna kill it on this one well we thought that too and you think that until you don't yeah. you know I mean until you make your first mistake and go oh that hurt and I some people say well I I've, I've met people that say I've never lost money in a real estate transaction I said well you haven't you done, haven't enough, done of enough of them <laughs> so you're gonna you're gonna screw up and so I I spend time on the mindset piece because if you know you're gonna get kicked around if you don't know how to get back up after you've been knocked down forget it and I love what you said about your clients you the most successful ones are the ones that get beat up but they don't they don't win or lose they win or learn you know it feels like you're losing at the time but if you don't learn from that mistake and, and I can speak for Amber and I we've had to some, have sometimes the same mistake two three four dozen times and then we finally figure it out <laughs> so sometimes you don't know, get the first time you're like oh my god but I think you've got to have that mindset to be successful and the fact that you've got that vantage point you know as an attorney you don't always see the best of the situations you see sometimes when you get to you they're tough right there's sometimes it's, it's something that maybe could have been avoided but I guess it keeps you in business but you you do the positive side and the negative side of real estate too right I mean you you've got the negative stuff too yeah I mean, most of what I, I, I try to I enjoy the transactional part of it and creating the deals more than when they go sour as with, you know, with anyone you like it when it's successful, but you know, a lot of it is even from the legal perspective, I'll see you know, clients that'll start as individuals, they'll do a project and then they'll create an LLC and say, you know, this part works for me. This doesn't, this creates an issue for my lender. Let's change this for the next deal. And I, one client in particular, you know, probably 10 years ago, you know, to go to kind of the fix and flip model is he was he had a house here he was doing a house there and at least before the pandemic not only was he now doing ground up construction you know as a full-scale developer had his was vertically integrated with his own construction company he probably was doing 100 houses at a time in terms of flipping so the scale that he was able to achieve in 10 years and to see that progress and him learn yeah it shouldn't be in my name i'm going to do it in, in an llc and then I'm going to change from that LLC to a limited partnership because I can save in California, you know, ten thousand dollars a year by changing that structure. And if I do my own construction company, I'm going to save on that, and I'm not going to have to deal with you know, some of those aspects. Yeah. The learning process that went on is just amazing, and now you can kind of succeed, you know, see the success that the client like that's been able to have, and certainly made mistakes along the way, and many mistakes, but. Yeah them and went on so that that really is the lesson is you learn from them and you adapt and you, you change to something that works yeah and that, that growth process can be painful but it can also be enjoyable you know there there are those growing pains that you go through when you're learning those tough lessons and but yeah. but it's good to try to enjoy the process it sounds like you like watching that growth process and like the the outcome of when somebody has been through that 
I do. I also like seeing the the real estate. Yeah, that's kind of what got me into it. You know, to see you're actually, you know, it's almost like building with blocks for me. You actually see something that you were built or you took this old duplex or house and you turned it into something new and bright and shiny. And I'm kind of behind the scenes helping them document the purchase agreement or, you know, the, the corporate documents and dealing with the partnerships and saying, okay, well, we're going to work together, but what happens if we don't? And how are we going to grow? How are we going to bring on new partners and actually see that process develop and kind of guide them through it, you know, being being that call of saying, you know, Jeff, how do we deal with, you know, we want to bring on a new investor who's going to contribute money to our partnership. How does that work in terms of what we've been doing? How do we protect ourselves um, and helping them figure figure that out so they're able to take the next step in the growth and progression of their real estate business? Yeah, awesome. Jeff, this has been great. Just hearing hearing about real estate from a lawyer's perspective is always good, right? To hear it there because you know we 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 deal with them on a regular basis here, and we certainly have our legal teams we work with. But it's always nice to hear about your perspective of of real estate and as you you know you you're obviously are passionate about it you you're excited about the growth you're excited about helping somebody else do that which, which is not all attorneys by the way so that's like kudos to you for that so it's great so tell people how they can reach you how can they find out learn more about you and how can they connect with you sure uh you can check out our webpage it's www.gibbs g-i-b-b-s g-i-d-e-n.com gibbs get in um, i'm also on linkedin you'll find you know more information about me, articles we've written about real, real estate, and uh, feel free to get in touch at any time. Awesome. Great. Very good. Yeah. Well, good. Well, listen, we appreciate you being here today, and I know you got more deals to go close, I'm sure, today, so we'll uh, let you go for now, but thanks very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay.